True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. In the spring of 2005, brother and sister Shasta and Dylan Groney were just normal kids. They were out playing in their yard in their bathing suits. It was a warm day. Neither they nor their parents had any way of knowing that a violent pedophile was watching them. Joseph Duncan III, recently paroled, had been trolling the area looking for fresh victims. He likely knew that this would be his last chance to live out his horrific fantasies before he would be returned to prison. Join us at the quiet end for Shasta's story. Shasta was just eight years old when the deeply disturbed Duncan invaded her home and proceeded to beat and tie up her family members. For the next several weeks, she experienced more trauma and fear than we can even imagine. Today we're going over the details of this crime, the criminal history of Duncan, and most importantly, the strength and determination of Shasta, a child who once showed remarkable courage in the face of terror, and a young woman now putting together the best life she can from her own broken and battered psyche. Coincidentally, Duncan died just last week as we were researching the case. He had been diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor about a year ago. He died at the medical center near United States Penitentiary in Terre Haute, where he was on death row, according to a statement from prosecutors in Riverside County, California. Also, this case was recommended to us by Julie. So thank you, Julie. It was a very interesting case. Disturbing, but interesting. Well, it might be one of the more disturbing ones that we've done. There is child abuse and sexual abuse. Of course, we will avoid going into too graphic of details, but a little extra warning for our sensitive tie grabbers. So we're drinking a a double bock today. It's called Double Vision Doppel Bock. It's by Grand Teton Brewing Company in Victor, Idaho. Bock beers are usually springtime beers, and it is spring, finally. Yes. So that's why we're having this one. Okay. It's an 8% alcohol by volume. This is a fairly typical double bock. It's dark brown, small tan head, got a very nice sweet malt aroma, maybe a hint of some dark fruit. Taste is great, caramel and molasses, and a little bit of, it seems like pie spice, you know, some cinnamon, nutmeg, that kind of stuff. Mm. Pretty robust beer at 8%, very nice. All right, well, open it up and slide a snifter over here for me. You got it. All right, down here at the quiet end where things are looking up. It's warm out, of course, so we have a lot of circulation of air, a lot of people to hang out with. It's a good day. A lot. I mean, we're still at 25% capacity, so there's not a huge crowd in here. Well, and it's not like you can snuggle right up to strangers and chat. (laughs) Not that I would anyway. Well, after a few beers, you might. (laughs) (laughs) I, I could. Yeah. You just get so friendly when you've had some alcohol in you. You're just the sweetest guy. (laughs) <laughs> I'm usually sweet You're anyway. not an angry drunk at all, that's for sure. No, I'm witty and charming. You are. Okay, so over here we are. Let's go ahead and start on this story. It is disturbing, very disturbing. Yes, it is. So we're going to go back to 2005. And at that time, Shasta Groney was living in a modest rural house in Lake Cardulaline, Idaho. She lived there with her mother, Brenda, her brothers, Dylan and Slade, and her mother's boyfriend, Mark McKenzie. The house was pretty secluded, but it was one of the first houses that you could see upon entering their Wolf Lodge Bay area neighborhood. There was a long driveway, about 150 yards long, and the house was surrounded by pine trees. Now, witnesses would later tell the police that strangers whose cars broke down in the nearby freeway occasionally went to the Groney home, and the family was always happy to help them out. Now, Brenda had divorced the children's father in 2001, 
She was just 21 years old when she married Steve Groney in 1986, and they had five children together during their 15-year marriage. The youngest was Shasta. She was eight. Dylan was nine, and Slade was 13. Slade was on the honor roll at his school, and he had a pretty nice talent for woodworking. He did some really good-looking pieces. And he also enjoyed doing outdoorsy things. But, you know, most of the boys in the area did. Well, yeah, that's pretty much what there is to do. Right. There's trees and <laughs> lakes and rivers and stuff. Yeah. Beautiful area, really. And I've heard there's a couple cities in Idaho. But... Oh, sure. <laughs> there are. Now, the, the two oldest boys, Vance and Jesse, didn't live at home. Jesse was 18. He was in jail when the family had been attacked. He was serving time for auto theft and shoplifting. And I don't have any information on Vance's whereabouts. Well, he had similar issues. He was three years older than Jesse. So he was 21 when all this happened. So this family was already having some difficult times prior to the horrible crimes of Joseph Duncan. Brenda was a devoted mom. She'd worked as a waitress. And then for a while, she'd owned her own house cleaning business. At the time of her death, she was on probation for possession of drug paraphernalia, and she had served some time in jail. The family was associated with some of the local biking community, and by that I mean motorbikes. And friends would say later that they were partiers, probably more than the average folks, but they weren't deep into the drug culture, they weren't selling drugs or shooting up drugs. Brenda and Mark did drink and smoke pot, however, and it had caused some trouble for Brenda. Brenda was supposed to complete a drug and alcohol abuse program ordered by the court, but she hadn't been able to complete these because she couldn't afford to pay for them. Finances were tight. Mark McKenzie was known as a hard worker, and he treated Brenda's children as his own. He was kind of a typical guy for rural Idaho, preferring to be outside most of the time. He liked to go hunting or fishing, but he often took the kids with him. He worked as a manager at Spokane Stainless Products, and he typically worked from early in the morning to five or six at night. So this was a demanding job, but Mark had worked his way up to manager after working for the company as a sink installer. And also Mark had no criminal record at all. Now he did own several guns, but on the night the family was attacked, that didn't help them. Might have been nice and we could have had a better ending here if Mark had shot Joseph Duncan. Whoa, my gun-fearing wife is advocating this? Well, in this kind of a case, there are a lot of things here I'm going to advocate that I wouldn't normally because I think this is an exceptionally horrible criminal. Someone who is just too far gone to be helped and should not be around any human being at all. Well, he, yeah, I still am unsure how he was able to get out on parole. But anyway. Well, that's a big problem. So when Shasta and her brother Dylan were growing up in this quiet neighborhood, Parents weren't afraid to let their kids play outside on their own or even to leave the children home alone while they went into town to run errands during the day. Children played outside without parental supervision all the time. They rode their bikes wherever they wanted, and they even built forts nearby in the woods. So Shasta's family didn't even lock their doors all the time. And of course, after this crime, things would change for the community. Huh, no kidding. So somewhere during the second week of May in 2005, Joseph Duncan showed up. And we don't know why he stopped in the Wolf Lodge Bay area, which is known as a pretty peaceful place where he could enjoy nature. It was just off the interstate, Interstate 90. So maybe he just by chance got off there. And anyway, there he was, and he ended up on the Groney's Family Road, which is Frontage Road, and he drove past their small white house. People have speculated that Duncan probably saw his intended victims, Shasta and her brother Dylan, playing outside the house in the unseasonably warm May weather. The kids often rode their bikes along Frontage Road. They liked to wave at passing motorists, and they liked to motion for the truckers to honk their air horns. Pretty typical for kids their age. Shasta yeah. was eight, Dylan was nine. Shasta and Dylan had been wearing their bathing suits on at least one of the days that weekend. And it has been theorized that it was the sight of two young children playing in their swimsuits that sexually attracted the depraved Duncan. Although he was so depraved, it wouldn't take much. Yeah, just being a kid would attract them. Yeah, it's gross. He hung around the area, though, for two or three days until he found the perfect spot 
to watch the kids and their family from a distance without being easily seen. He used a night vision apparatus to watch them after dark through their windows. So while the exact timeline isn't known, police believe that Duncan stalked the family for several days until he became comfortable with the property and the family's habits. He may have even followed them into town when they shopped and ran errands. So that's just a horrible thought. Isn't it? Oh, terrible. So over the weekend of May 13th to 15th, Shasta and Dylan's mother, Brenda, who was 40 years old at that time, she came and went. So did Mark McKenzie, who was 37, and Shasta and Dylan's older brother, Slade, who was 13. On Sunday, May 15th, the family drove into Curdialine to run errands. Then they returned home where they had a barbecue with friends and family. Now the get-together ended in the early evening, and the friends went home and the family got ready for bed. This turns out to be the last time anybody could remember seeing Brenda, Slade, and Mark alive. So the unfathomable crime that Duncan was about to commit was actually out of character for him. His prior victims had all been children, victims who were just unable to defend themselves against him. He was six foot two, tall and lanky though, at about only 150 pounds. So he could have been easily taken down by Mark if it was just man on man, but he had come prepared with weapons. Before the Gronies had their barbecue that Sunday, a neighbor named Robert Hollinsworth had hired 13-year-old Slade Grony to mow the grass by his driveway. Hollinsworth hadn't had the correct change to pay Slade their agreed-upon $10 for the mowing, so he'd promised he would stop by Slade's house the next day and pay him. When Hollinsworth showed up with the money early Monday evening, May 16th, the house was very oddly quiet. This was a busy family who liked to be outside and do things. Hollinsworth honked his horn, but he didn't get out of his car right away because normally Slade would just run out there, but nobody came outside as they normally would. So when Hollinsworth got out of his car, he walked up to the small covered porch, but then stopped suddenly. He saw dark reddish stains near the front door. This was really startling. When he looked closer, Hollinsworth saw a lot of blood in the doorway and on the steps. He saw no lights on inside the house, and he noticed that both of the family's cars were parked in their usual places. But some car doors were open. So growing very worried about this family, he hurried back home to call 911. Yeah, and this was actually the second time that day that the sheriff's department had heard from Hollingsworth. The first time... It was in the morning he called to report an abandoned white pickup truck that was parked out near his barn. So when deputies from the county sheriff's department arrived at the house on East Frontage Road at 6.15 in the evening, after Hollingsworth called that time, there was a significant amount of blood on the doorway and on the steps. A lot of it was spattered. So the sheriff's department people knocked on the door, but no response. Then they yelled for someone to respond and come to the door. Nobody did. They were walking around the house to try to look in through the windows. Based on the amount of blood that they had seen outside, deputies were understandably afraid that the family might be injured or even dead. So they made the quick decision to enter the house. They found a back door that had been unlocked, so they went in that way. And once inside, they were just stunned by what they found. Blood was everywhere. Some of it was puddled around two bodies that were sprawled out on the floor. Both of these victims had been bound with duct tape and zip ties. Their injuries looked like they were primarily on their heads and faces. One of the victims was an adolescent boy who was later confirmed to be Slade. He was face down in a pool of blood. At first, it looked like he had been killed by a gunshot by a gunshot wound to his head. There was a bunch of duct tape wrapped around his head. Duct tape was also used to bind his hands behind his back. And next to Slade was an adult woman who appeared to be in her early 40s, Brenda. She was lying face down between the kitchen and the living room with a severe injury to her head. She was also lying in a large pool of blood that looked like it originated from her head. Her hands were also bound behind her back with duct tape and her feet were bound with zip ties. As the deputies moved through the house, they found a third victim. This was a bald man with facial hair That's Mark McKenzie. He was lying on the living room floor surrounded by blood. 
Like Brenda and Slade, his hands and feet were bound with duct tape and zip ties. It looked like he had died of either a gunshot wound to his head or blunt trauma. Blood was everywhere. Actually, the smell of congealed blood was so excessive that it nauseated the deputies. Obviously, they didn't expect to find three dead people in a sea of blood in this house. Violent crime was pretty rare in this area, and this was an extremely violent crime. Yeah, something like this doesn't happen every day, but there was plenty of evidence found in the house, including bloody footprints, bloody handprints, blood smears on the walls and the floors, and of course the blood spatter. No one else was found in the house. They found several guns in different rooms throughout the house, but none were near the victim's bodies. They were told that there were two other people who lived there, though, eight-year-old Shasta and her nine-year-old brother Dylan, but there's no sign of those little kids anywhere. Mark McKenzie's mother, Lee McKenzie Wood, was at home watching the news when the story of a murder at Wolf Lodge popped up on the screen, and this was along with a photo of the small white house where her son lived. Knowing that there were only two families in that whole area, she was just terrified. So she drove right over to the house and found that the police had blocked off the road as well as the property. She did run up and speak to one of the deputies and said, there are five people in there. And he said, no, ma'am, there are only three. So where are the two little kids? Yeah, they've been taken. So from witness statements and body temperatures of the victims, the detectives expected that the victims had been killed sometime late Sunday evening or in the early morning hours that Monday. But where were Shasta and Dylan? Now they weren't sure if maybe the kids had gotten scared and run off. They're hoping they're alive. The investigator's first priority was to find these two missing children. Then they needed to find whoever was responsible for these murders. In an effort to find the kids, volunteers searched the wooded areas that surrounded the Grony Mackenzie home and other police agencies, including the Idaho State Police and the FBI, helped to canvas the area. So they showed Shasta and Dylan's photos to residents in the area, asking if they'd seen them recently. Eventually, an Amber Alert was sent out nationwide for them, describing Dylan as 4 feet tall, 60 pounds, blue eyes with a blonde crew cut. And Shasta was 3 feet 10 inches tall, 40 pounds, with hazel eyes and long brown hair. So these are just tiny, tiny little kids. It's horrific. Now, the property next door to the Gronies was owned by Robert Hollingsworth, and this was the man who had first called the sheriff's department. Parked on his property was a silver-colored 1988 Ford pickup truck with Idaho license plate, and this, this truck was registered to Lisa and Daniel Miller. According to Hollingsworth, he had discovered the truck on his property around 6.30 Monday morning, May 16th. That's when he had gone out to take care of his livestock. Hollingsworth didn't know why the truck was there on his property. Now, in the bed of the pickup, detectives found a roll of duct tape, and they found a wadded-up ball of used duct tape with some grass clippings and other debris stuck to it. So the truck could have been driven across the pasture from the Grony property to Hollingsworth without being seen. Police got a warrant to search all the vehicles on the property and the pickup that was on Hollingsworth's land. So as you can imagine, news of 13-year-old Slade's death was devastating to his 7th grade classmates. The violent manner of his death, as well as the death of his mother and her boyfriend, shocked the students and the faculty. Shasta and Dylan were students at Fernan Elementary School, and school personnel, including counselors, were available to any of those students who felt that they needed to talk about what had happened. But there's really no way for a child that young to understand. I mean, we can't even really understand as adults, so how is a child supposed to make any sense of this? I think it's just a devastating thing for everyone. An early person of interest in the case was Robert Roy Lutner, 33 years old, who was known in the area as Concrete Bob. He'd been given that nickname because he worked laying concrete. Concrete Bob was a friend of the victims, and he'd visited them twice recently once on the Friday afternoon before the murders, and then again on Sunday evening, just short time before the murders. So Jesse Groney told the detectives that Bob owed Brenda and Mark $2,000. 
Remember, Jesse's the 18-year-old son of Brenda who didn't live with them. Right. He's the one who was in prison during this. Jail. Jail. There's a difference. But Jesse also told the investigators that none of his relatives believed that there'd been any trouble between him and his family. There really was no indication that he was being pressured to repay the money to them, even though, of course, the family could have used it. Jesse also told the police that he had never seen this guy be hostile or angry with his family at all. So no one in the family believed that Bob had anything to do with the homicides. Further investigation showed that he'd been in trouble with the law before, though, and his criminal record was fairly long. He'd been arrested for drug possession in 1992 and domestic battery in 2004 after he had a fight with his girlfriend outside of a bar. He'd been convicted twice for fraud in connection with improperly representing unemployment claims. So he was someone the police needed to talk to. He'd been seen in an area bar on Sunday afternoon before he had visited the Grony's house that day. Then two days later, on Tuesday, he talked to his probation officer on the phone and told him he was taking a trip to Boise. By that time, though, he had heard about the murders and he was reportedly crying about it when he called up a friend. Yeah, the next day, Wednesday, May 18th, Bob learned that the police were looking for him. So he turned himself in to sheriff's deputies after he returned from Boise. He was interviewed. He denied having anything to do with the murders. He did take a polygraph test, and he passed it. And he was, after that and for the questioning, he was eliminated as a person of interest. And there were still numerous tips coming in. None of them led to finding either a suspect or the kids. Autopsies on the the dead bodies, Brenda, Mark, and Slade, confirmed that all three had been bludgeoned to death. So they had fractures of the skull and brain injury. Terrible way to die. Although the investigators were not saying publicly what they believed the murder weapon to be, local newspapers reported that a claw hammer was was likely the murder weapon. So that's a horrible way to kill someone. I mean, I can't think of much else that would be so brutal and messy. Well, you're beaten to death, and it's a painful, horrible. yeah. Horrible. Yeah, you're right. Now, a toxicology analysis showed that traces of THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, have been found in the blood of Brenda and Mark, along with traces of methamphetamine. So investigators said they didn't know if the couple's drug use was recreational or more serious, but there was no indication that they were selling any. No, and most people said that it was mainly pot and drinking, and the area they were in, there was some meth going on. But it didn't seem like either of them were strung out on it or using it all the time. Yeah, plus if they weren't certain to be selling it, that would eliminate some suspects, right? Maybe not suspects, but at least a motive Right, could be eliminated if they were dealing, but they probably weren't. No, there was no sign that they had been. Actually, Mark was a very good employee at his job, as far as anyone could say, as far as anyone knew. So the fact that there was no forced entry to the house led the police to believe that the victims may have opened their door to someone they knew. But then they also theorized that the killer or killers may have snuck up on them, taken them by surprise, while they were asleep. If that latter theory was correct, the detectives presumed that the killer had entered through that rear kitchen door that had been left unlocked. And the killer, or at this point they're thinking it could have been more than one killer, had definitely entered the house well prepared. They brought their own weapon, duct tape, and zip ties. So this was a planned thing. Yes, it was. It wasn't random at all. No, not at all. Now, the fact that the killer was able to bind his victims without a struggle suggested either that he might have had assistance from other people or he had a gun or some some other weapon. Questions were raised as people tried to figure out what had happened. Biggest question, obviously, was whether Shasta and her brother were still alive. And if so, where were they? Now, they got more than 150 phone calls during the first 12 hours. There were up to six people on the phones at all times, and they took calls from concerned citizens, other friends of the family, tons of people trying to help. Some of the tips came from parents whose children had known Shasta and Dylan and had told their parents about the outdoor locations where they played. So they searched a lot of these areas described by the kids, including some forts that they had built in the hills. No sign at all of Dylan or Shasta. 
Well, on May 19th, police received a call from a clerk who worked at a store that sold mostly hunting and fishing gear. He was in Bonners Ferry, Idaho, which is about 75 miles away from Coeur d'Alene. The clerk had seen a white van with Washington license plates and a man with two children got out of the van and came into the store. The clerk told deputies that the man had asked for directions to Libby, Montana, just across the border from Bonnie's Ferry. Then they left. Sheriff's deputies and state troopers searched the highway and the side roads between Bonner's Ferry and Libby, but they still didn't find the van, so that turned out to be a dead end. Probably wasn't them. Yeah, probably wasn't. But that same day, Shasta and Dylan's biological father, Steve Groney, made a really emotional plea on TV for the safe return of his children. He got on there. Please release my children safely, he said. Now, he was fairly active in their lives. He wasn't an absentee father. So his voice was hoarse from crying, and he had friends and relatives huddled around him. And he said, they had nothing to do with any of this. Release them in a safe area where law enforcement can find them. Call the helpline. Let them know where they can be found. So then Steve didn't take any questions from reporters, but some investigators found his statement kind of suspicious, especially the part where he said that his children had nothing to do with any of this. Yeah, I would like to question Steve and find out what did he mean by that? Yeah, it's kind of weird, and of course he was questioned. I'm sure he was. But there was never any evidence to substantiate Steve Groney as a suspect or even a person of interest. He was certainly grieving for Slade and devastated by the disappearance of his two little children. There were satellite television production vehicles at their remote home, which gave video and audio feeds to shows like A Current Affair and America's Most Wanted. So a lot of publicity. And the publicity did help the sheriff's department collect money. They had more than $70,000 in reward money, and that would get up to $107,000. So the following week, Sunday, May 22nd, Geraldo Rivera was at the local fairgrounds and he filmed his show that he had at the time called At Large. Steve Groney was on the show and he told Rivera that the FBI believed he had not been truthful with them. So according to Steve, the FBI polygraph examiner told him, Steve, I have to tell you, I have doubts. You haven't passed portions of this polygraph. Now, that to me just sounds like the police trying out some kind of technique. Yeah, I I would think. If he truly failed it, they'd come out and say, you failed. Right. And they'd want to question him further. So saying, well, you did okay, but there's some portions that you untruthful on. Yeah, they're fishing. Yeah, I think so. But Steve Groney said that he and Brenda had argued before the killings. He said that he had asked Brenda for permission to have the children for an unscheduled visit for a few days prior to a two-week school vacation. So the disagreement happened on Friday, May 13th, and Brenda had refused to let them go with him. He also told Rivera that he was living in the same house as Brenda's mother, but that neither she nor anyone else saw him come home that Sunday night, May 15th. So he couldn't provide an alibi from about 10 p.m. Sunday until 6 a.m. Monday, and this is the approximate time frame for the killings. Uh, Interesting. His former mother-in-law didn't see him come home, and no one else saw him until he went to work on Monday morning. So the use of illicit drugs did come up during the interview, and Steve said that although he and Brenda had argued in the past over his belief that she and Mark were using meth, he had only heard rumors that they were using the drugs, and he had no proof of it. He said that he had been concerned that they might be using drugs in front of the kids. His oldest son, Vance, said that he believed his mother, Slade, and Mark were killed by people that they knew. He also said that the family dogs weren't friendly to strangers, and they were even known to bark at neighbors when they went by. So that kind of means it would be difficult for him to sneak right up on them while they're sleeping. Right. If they've got barking dogs. Steve has probably been to the house sometimes. Maybe he's the perp. That's not what Vance was suggesting, was it? I don't think so, but if he's saying that the dogs would bark at strangers and they didn't bark. Well, yeah, that's his reason for saying it would be someone they knew, but not necessarily his father. No, no, I'm not suggesting that he did it. Although there's there's a few things that sound interesting here. Well, of course they're going to look into that, right? Yeah. 
but Steve started his own tip line and he offered his $25,000 motorcycle as a reward for anyone who came forward with any useful information. And although he did begin receiving a number of calls, none of them turned out to be helpful. Investigators insisted publicly that nobody had been eliminated as a suspect yet. But he was quick to say that neither Steve Groney or any other member of his family was under any serious suspicion. So hadn't been eliminated, but they really don't think it was him. Yeah. And then when results of blood evidence from the crime scene came back, none of the samples contained Dylan or Shasta's DNA. So somewhat of a relief. Everyone had some hope that the kids were unharmed or at least still alive. All of the blood that was found and, and tested for DNA belonged to Slade, Mark, and Brenda. Now, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children put out posters for each of the children, and they distributed them by fax to businesses throughout the United States and Canada. Here we are now three weeks into the investigation, and we are no closer to finding the kids. There had been more than 700 interviews and over 1,500 tips received, but nothing significant had been learned. Must have been frustrating. Very, and scary. It was far from being a cold case, but the chances of finding the children alive was getting dimmer and dimmer with each passing day. Absolutely. When describing this crime to the public, the police held back some facts like they have to do, but they did say it was an emotional, violent crime scene, which was likely premeditated. Whoever was responsible had brought along his own materials to bind his victims, as well as his own weapons. Such violent, premeditated crimes are usually done for drugs, love, or money. But this case was definitely different. There was nothing in the victims' backgrounds that explained three violent murders and the abduction of two children. And if someone wanted to steal children, why wouldn't he just grab them out of the yard or off the street? Oh, sure. Why would you go in and kill people? Right. It was really exceptionally violent and pretty much unheard of for something like this to happen. Absolutely. Shasta had been in the second grade when she was taken, and before she disappeared, she'd written a poem about her father. So her teacher gave the poem to Steve Groney during a school gathering, which they held to reaffirm hopes that the children would return safely. And when Father's Day came that summer, Steve was still waiting for any news on Dylan and Shasta. Of course, his Father's Day wish was for them to be found safe and brought back to him. I think everyone that knew them was wishing for that. But he admitted that he had to prepare himself for the worst, because we know the statistics. There's not a good chance when this much time passes. Very rare to find kids alive. He had taken a leave of absence from his job, and he'd stopped playing with his band on the weekends. He was having a hard time functioning, really. He did recall the last time he had seen his three children. They'd spent a weekend with him three weeks before the killings. Slade and Dylan had spent most of their time playing video games together, while Shasta had cuddled on the couch with him and they watched her favorite TV shows. So, of course, at this point, he knows it's too late for Slade and he's grieving that horrible loss. But he's still trying to hold out hope that he'll see his younger two again. And he needed a lot of support because that hope wasn't necessarily going to stay there on its own. He had to work at keeping that hope. Oh, absolutely. July 2nd, Saturday morning, early, 1.30, there was an unexpected break in the case. We were, what, about six weeks into this, where the kids were taken. Yeah. So a man driving a red Jeep Cherokee with Missouri license plates pulled into the parking lot of a Curdoline Denny's restaurant north of Interstate 90. A guy was seen getting out of a Jeep with a little girl and the little girl had an angry look on her face. The man and the little girl walked into the restaurant. They passed two young men who were outside smoking cigarettes. Nick Chapman and Chris Dolan were the guys puffing away. They would both recall there was something odd about the man. They thought his demeanor was just kind of off. Nick looked at the girl and made brief eye contact, and he was shocked because he recognized her as the missing girl, Shasta Groney. And he had absolutely no doubt that it was her, because he had just seen a billboard with her and her brother's photos earlier that evening. So as Shasta and the man entered the restaurant, they passed a flyer with Shasta's photo, 
in the entryway. And th this flyer disappeared just a short time later. Interesting. Somebody tore it off, huh? Well, sure, I wonder who. And once they were seated at a booth, the man ordered food and drinks for himself and the girl. The little girl didn't seem like a typical child. When the waitress gave her crayons and a children's placemat, she didn't smile and she didn't show any interest in it. No, and the waitress recognized her as well. The photos of these kids had been all over the area. But the two young guys that were out smoking, Nick and Chris, they stayed outside for a moment, and Nick wrote down the license plate number on the Jeep. He was determined that he would not allow the man to leave the restaurant with Shasta. His girlfriend Tessa was inside the restaurant with Nick's girlfriend, Rayla, and Chris sent a text to Tessa telling her that the little girl looked just like Shasta Groney. Then he called 911 to report what he had seen. Tessa and Rayla were sitting just a few booths away from Shasta, and Nick and Chris came back in trying to act casual, and then they informed the Denny's employees of what they had noticed. A waitress, Amber Dean, had already recognized Shasta, and she had already notified her manager, who also called 911. So police are on their way. Yeah, it was just about 10 minutes later, and three police cars entered the parking lot, and they were single file with their lights off. When the first one pulled in, the man with Shasta motioned for the waitress to bring him his bill. Then he got up and took Shasta with him toward the restrooms. So this made witnesses nervous, believing that he must have seen the police car and he was going to try and take off with her out the back. But then Shasta and the man returned from the restrooms, and the police officers approached him. Before the police could escort him out of the building, he leaned in and said to Shasta, Promise me you'll visit me in prison. Jesus. Scumbag. Only Shasta could hear him, but she later told investigators what he had said, and of course everyone was disgusted. But once the man was removed, Amber the waitress said to Shasta, What's your name, honey? And she said her name and started to cry. Amber picked up the little girl and held her and tried to comfort her as Shasta continued to cry. Shasta repeated her name to one of the police officers, and then she said to him, I want my daddy. I want to go home. So nobody can ever really know the full amount of trauma this girl went through. No, I mean, even, even when she can testify or give statements about it, it doesn't begin to describe what he did to her. No, and just being so alone and isolated with this brutal man. Horrible. Horrible. So the man was taken to the local jail, and Shasta was taken to a nearby hospital to be examined and observed. She seemed to be pretty much in good health, but of course extremely traumatized. She remained in the hospital for two days where she was under police protection. But of course everyone's wondering about Dylan, but they really don't want to pressure her to talk about her experience. They know she's been through a lot. But Shasta's father, Steve, was in the Seattle area visiting his sister, when he got the phone call from the sheriff's department telling him that Shasta had been found alive. So, of course, he came home immediately and was reunited with his daughter in the hospital. He was able to stay in the hospital with her. She did appear to be fine, but her ordeal obviously left her in bad shape, confused, grieving, who knows what all. According to data from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Victims of sexual abuse and violence often develop PTSD, where they get nightmares, feelings of impending doom, and difficulty with concentration. But what Shasta experienced was exceptionally traumatic. I would say that she would need to have years of therapy, maybe ongoing therapy. And this is, this is a, just a horrible thing. Yeah, I don't know if she could ever really be. Well, she could never be the way she was before or the way she would have been if this hadn't happened to her. Right. But, yeah, it's just really horrible. So by the next morning, Shasta's abductor was identified as one Joseph Edward Duncan III. He was a 42-year-old fugitive sex offender from Fargo, North Dakota. Now, we got some conflicting stories of where he was born. We have one version where he was born in New Orleans, another version being born in Fort Bragg, and the third version, and the most common one, was that he was born in Tacoma, Washington. And according to investigators who looked into Duncan's history, 
He was born in Tacoma in 1963. His parents were Joseph E. Duncan, Jr. and Lillian May Duncan. They had five children. His father was in the military, so they moved around quite a bit. According to Duncan, he had his first sexual experience when he was an eight-year-old, and that was with two of his sisters. 1971, this happened. In 1975, he sexually assaulted a five-year-old boy. So he was, what, 12 years old. In 1978, he sexually assaulted a nine-year-old at gunpoint. Yeah, so he was just 15 in 1979 when he was first arrested. And this was after engaging in a high-speed chase in a stolen car. So afterwards, he was sent to a ranch for juvenile offenders in Tacoma. During the months he spent there, he said, he had bound and sexually assaulted six younger boys. And he would estimate that he had raped 13 younger boys at the ranch by the time he was 16 years old. So something's seriously wrong at that ranch, if that could have happened. Well, I'm not doubting that. I think it could have. Yeah, maybe. But of course you can't believe him. Well, he'll say anything. He would, yeah. Now, his education ended in the 10th grade, even though he was a pretty intelligent person. But by this time, he had definitely decided on a life of crime. In January of 1980, he stole a gun from a neighbor's house, and then he used this gun to abduct a 14-year-old boy who was on his way to school. Duncan was holding the gun and had forced the kid into the woods, and he made him undress and perform oral sex on him. Ugh. Then when he was finished assaulting the boy, he beat him with a piece of wood and burned him with a cigarette. Then he returned the boy's clothing to him and told him to get out of there, run away. Now, he got arrested later that same day, and for this crime, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. So in May of 1980, they sent Duncan to Western State Hospital's sexual psychopath program to try and treat him. And he was allowed extended visits with his family. And when he was on these visits, he would sneak out on at least two occasions to look into neighbors' windows and to do some public masturbating. Duncan's therapist at the time believed that he was making conscious choices to continue his deviant behavior. He liked it. So because of this, he was categorized as not amenable to treatment, and then he was returned to the prison to finish his sentence. So he didn't really get much treatment, and he made no effort to try and get treated. Yes, so I assume that's why they said he was going back to prison. Yes. But in prison, there were multiple occasions when he was put into segregation for having contraband items. And these included a VCR, two VCR tapes containing pornography, some needles, and some razor blades. He was also caught ordering pornographic magazines through the mail. And these weren't just Playboy or Penthouse. These magazines promoted child pornography and bondage. But these infractions didn't add any time to his sentence. He was put in segregation for a while, and that was about it. Okay. But you would think someone who's continuing to look for child pornography should be kept longer. Should never really be released. One would think. So in 1989, he wrote to parole officers, and he told them that he had made the important decision to explore his feminine traits. And I found a pen pal named David Wolfert. Wolfert began talking to Duncan on the phone, and he even drove the 270 miles from his home to prison to see Duncan. He actually became an advocate for Duncan, even writing letters to the parole board on his behalf. Now, he was just one of the people Duncan became friends with from prison and who he was able to manipulate into supporting him. He didn't have friends. He had people he used. Well, they felt like they were his friends. Well, yeah. But he was really good from a young age at manipulating people. He was intelligent, which made him more dangerous. Yeah, well, he knew how to read people and uh, hit their vulnerable spots. And tell them what they want to hear. Right. So, unfortunately, in 1994, Duncan was let out on parole, and he was sent to a halfway house in Seattle. Two years later, he told his parole officer that he was exploring a relationship with a married woman who was the mother of two. This woman worked with Duncan, and she was assisting him in choosing clothing for him to cross-dress and explore the possibility that he was transsexual. So with some people, he played the role of a sexually confused man with some transsexual fantasies. 
and to others he was a homosexual who just had difficulty coming out. He was very good at gaining their trust. He could also be an excellent employee when he wanted to, you know, if it served his purposes. In one temporary job he held at a software company, he was able to manipulate one of the managers into writing a glowing letter of recommendation for him. And, for example, the letter read in part, Out of 30 temporary reps that I hired during the holiday season, Joe stands out as one of the best all-round performers. I would not hesitate to hire him again. So that's a pretty glowing recommendation. (laughs) Sure is. In 1996, Duncan violated his parole by possessing a gun and using marijuana. He also failed several times to get permission from his parole officer to visit relatives and other people who had children living with them. Now, I have to tell you, I would think one time of doing that, he should have been back in prison. One would think. Why was he able to do this several times? You get plenty of chances, right? Well, you shouldn't when you're on parole. You're supposed to very strictly have these rules or you get thrown back in. But with him, he just really got away with a lot. What they eventually did was put him in jail for 30 days, but then he was released again. Yeah, big deal. Yeah, nothing had changed. A slap on the wrist. And he's still the same person. He's not treated, he's not making any efforts, nothing. So after his release, he was relocated to Fargo, North Dakota, and he enrolled at North Dakota State University as a computer science major. He registered as a sex offender, as he was required to do. He was classified as a level 3 offender. Level 3 offenders are considered high risk for recidivism. But for a time, he did seem to be following all of the rules. And that's until July 3, 2004. According to a complaint against Duncan in Becker County District Court by the Detroit Lakes Police Department, and that's in the state of Minnesota, Duncan had sexually assaulted two boys at a local middle school. And if you ask me, this was just bound to happen. He shouldn't have been out. Of course it was. People like that should just not be out and about. It's not fair to the rest of the people, especially children. But according to this complaint, two boys, little boys, age six and eight, told the police that they'd been playing at the middle school when a man drove up in a small, shiny red car. This man was carrying a video camera, and he walked to a secluded area near the playground. He called the boys over to him then. And when they approached him, he reached out, pulled down the six-year-old's shorts, and touched his genitals. And then he tried to do the same thing to the eight-year-old, but thankfully the boys ran away, and then the man left. But the six-year-old gave a good description of this man. The description was entered into the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension Predatory Database and it came up with Joseph Duncan III as a match. Duncan also drove a red two-door Pontiac Grand Am at this time, so the boy was able to pick Duncan out from a group of photos. And there was also a witness who had seen the red Grand Am parked near the playground on the day of the assault. So it looked like the justice system was going to work here, and maybe he wouldn't have any more victims. But then there was some kind of holdup in the system, and it actually ended up taking nine months till March 4th, 2005, for the complaint to be filed, and then another whole month for Duncan to be indicted. Yeah, but then the judge allowed Duncan to be released on $15,000 bail. How? Yeah, that's just ridiculous. There was a local businessman named Joe Crary who posted his bond. This guy, he apparently was friendly with Duncan because they both rode bikes on trails in Fargo. Now, he wasn't the first who was seemingly normal person to help out Duncan. There was a Dr. Richard Waxman, a pediatrician who lived in Fargo, told the police that he had given Duncan $6,500 before his court hearing to help him pay attorney fees. Now, God, a pediatrician has to know what the prognosis for this guy is. Yeah, I don't think that Waxman was a very good guy because he was helping him out, and it's just pretty weird. Well, maybe they had like interests. Well, and there might have been something going on, because Waxman would later say he was bisexual, although he was married to a woman and had a family. Something wrong with this guy. Absolutely. In fact, back in 1997, Waxman asked a prison board in Washington if they would release Duncan to live in his home. 
The board members rejected that idea, and they're basically protecting Waxman's children, saying they wouldn't expose his children to that kind of risk. So how about the father slash pediatrician? He has no concerns about this? So I guess he just seemed to believe that Duncan was this polite, sincere guy who wanted to turn his life around, and there were a handful of people that fell for this. Yeah, but guess what? So he, he gets released and he took off. Of course he did. Boy, big surprise. He likely knew that he would get a long prison sentence. So this time, at this point, he's probably more dangerous than ever. Of course. Right now, what's he got to lose? He's really got nothing to lose because he knows next time he's not going to get out. And within a few weeks, Brenda, Slade, Mark, and Dylan would all be murder victims of Duncan. And of course, Shasta would never be the same. Her life has been blown up. Joseph Duncan had been doing a blog for years, and he called it the fifth nail. Now, this is a reference to the hanging of Christ on a cross, and it summed up his thoughts on the persecution of sex offenders. The blog advocated for sex offenders and called for the reform of the laws. And Duncan was very angry about the sex offender registry. In his final post before going to commit his crimes in Idaho, he talked about striking out against society for treating him unfairly. Yeah, this is a horrible blog. Don't even look for it. It'll just upset you very much. I'm not going to. Because he was able to keep doing it from prison for a while. So putting together the events leading up to and during Duncan's murder of the Grony family members and the abduction, torture, and abuse of Shasta, here's what we know. After posting his $15,000 bail in Minnesota, Duncan left the state. He briefly returned to Fargo, where he purchased night vision goggles and a video camcorder from a Walmart. I had no idea Walmart had night vision goggles. <laughs> I guess they have everything. Full service. Well, are you allowed to hunt at night? I, mean, I, I didn't that. think so. Me but either. I guess you can camp and walk around. I don't know. There's all kinds of reasons you could give. But I just thought that that was kind of strange. Uh, definitely. But anyway, he would also end up purchasing a shotgun and shells and a hammer. So April 15th, he rented a red Jeep Cherokee in St. Paul, Minnesota. He didn't have any intention of ever returning this Jeep, and it would be reported stolen on May 4th. He traveled through Missouri to an area bordering Kansas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. So it was April 27th when he stole a set of license plates and put them on the Jeep. Once he'd changed the plates, Duncan headed north to Interstate 90 and headed west, and it's believed he entered Idaho during the first week of May. So by now, he'd missed his check-in with his parole officer, so an arrest warrant was issued. He arrived at the Wolf Lodge Bay area where the Groney family lived in the second week of May, and at some point, he was at Frontage Road and saw the small white house with green trim, and we know that he watched the family for some time before he made his move. So it's almost like a horror film to think someone's out there watching you. Super creepy. Yeah. And you don't know that he's out there yet. They had no idea. They think they're out, you know, in the boonies, safe, letting yeah. the kids, you know, just enjoy nature. And he's watching. He's got his night vision glasses. Holy and the cow. thing is, he probably could have grabbed one of the children. So I think he wanted to kill people. There would be a way to abduct children without killing all these people. Well, like you said, these kids were allowed to play outside. Yeah. Un unsupervised, you know. Sure. As long as you're home for dinner, you're doing okay. So, yeah, he could have. But I think what you're describing, the way he entered the house when he did the killings, he had his hammer, he had his zip ties. So he, he came weaponized. He's ready to kill. Yeah, he had a shotgun too, even though he didn't shoot them. But yeah, he was ready, and I think he was excited about it, really. It's a horrible thought, but I think he was. Yes. This was just good times for him. So a lot of what's known about the crime itself came from interviews with Shasta. In her police interview, she said that she and Dylan had been sleeping in their bedrooms when Duncan entered the house. Their mother called out to them from the living room and woke them up. And once she walked out, once Shasta walked out to the living room, she saw Duncan standing over her brother and parents. He was wearing gloves. He was holding a long gun. Now her brother Slade, her mother, and Mark McKenzie looked to be all bound with duct tape and zip ties. So it's kind of amazing to me that he was able to get them all bound. Well, he had the rifle, right? He did, yes. And I think 
He really tried to make them think it was just a robbery so they'd cooperate. I think if Mark and Brenda knew what he had in mind, they would have just fought with everything they had, oh, no probably. matter what. Yeah, I think the, the description here, they're all face down with their hands bound behind their backs. Yeah. They were told, I'm going to tie you up and I'm going to rob the place and I don't want you saying anything. Sure, I think so. He was very clever, such a scumbag. Yeah. But then he tied up Dylan and Shasta and he carried them outside put them in a white pickup truck that was parked on the property. Then he returned to the house, and he killed Mark, Brenda, and Slade. After Duncan had gone back inside the house, Shasta heard Mark crying out in pain. And then she saw Slade come running outside, because he was the only one whose feet weren't bound. And Shasta would say that she could see that her brother was badly injured. He had a very deep head wound, which was bleeding heavily. And she would actually say, from her child's vocabulary and point of view, Slade was brain dead when he came out. So this is a thing that she's going to grow up. How do you ever get that out of your mind? With great difficulty. Yeah, it's just... If, I am, if you can. It's so heartbreaking for her. I'm more heartbroken for her than the murder victims. Because well, she's the one that has to try and live with all she this. She has to deal with it. Yeah. Now, even though Shasta had not witnessed the murders... She told police that Duncan had shown her and Dylan a hammer, and he told them he had used it to kill their family members. She even remembered the brand name on the hammer, Fat Max. Yes, yeah, so when Shasta and Dylan were held captive by Duncan, he had told them many times how he had killed their family members. Yeah, he's just playing with them. He'd even explained how he had been driving by one day and saw them playing outside. He told Shasta that he watched them for two or three days and even looked into their windows at night. He'd even been able to scope out the inside floor plan by using those night vision goggles. In the story Duncan told Shasta, he had driven the stolen Jeep over to the Hollinsworth property and he parked it by an outbuilding. And it was dark out, so he walked across the field with a flashlight. And then once at Shasta's house, he found the back door unlocked and went inside. He did say that their dogs did bark at him, but he was able to just scare them away. And he'd gotten the keys to the pickup from Mark, as well as Mark's wallet. So after he killed those three family members, Duncan drove the two little ones across the field and then transferred them into the Jeep. So that's where the, the white pickup that Hollingsworth found the next morning. That was that. Exactly. So he drove with the kids to Montana. And he showed Shasta and Dylan a map of where they were. The area where he held them was the Lalo Forest. There, they stayed at a campsite. Shasta talked about some of the things that had happened at the campsite, including how Duncan had repeatedly molested both kids and tortured Dylan. So at least at this point, with both of them still alive, he wasn't torturing Shasta also, just Dylan. Well, he was molesting her, which okay. is arguably torture. Yeah. But she had to watch him really take his anger out on Dylan, from what she said. Yes. Using his video camera, Duncan filmed himself with the children. And the video footage has been described as extremely disturbing. Fortunately, it isn't out there on the internet. Duncan had described to Shasta many of the horrible details of what he did to Dylan. He molested that boy over and over. He burned him with cigarettes. And then, after he'd had them in his custody for over six weeks, he shot and killed Dylan. Yeah, according to the Spokane, Washington newspaper, Spokesman Review, Shasta told investigators that Duncan had told her Dylan's death was an accident. As she said, she'd been standing on the other side of the Jeep when she heard a loud shot. And she ran to the other side and saw Dylan lying on the ground screaming. This is awful. Duncan said he had been pawing through a box for beer when the shotgun went off and it shot Dylan in his abdomen. When Shasta got around and, and saw him, she saw Duncan put the gun to Dylan's head and pulled the trigger. Didn't go off. So here's Dylan begging Duncan not to kill him, but he reloaded the rifle and shot him in the head, and he was dead instantly. Now, after he did that, Shasta said Duncan cried and said he was just putting Dylan out of his misery. Fuck him. That is so disgusting. I mean, for one thing, the boy shouldn't have been there, of course. And even if he had been shot in the abdomen, 
There was a chance he could have been taken to a hospital and saved. He just yeah, put him down, shot yeah. him. It's well, disgusting. It's disgusting. It is. The whole uh, thing. That's what he's going to do with Shasta, too. That was the plan. I believe that, yes. Yeah, and he did tell Shasta that he had spared her because she had taught him how to love. Fuck him. But every indication we have is that he was planning to kill her, too. Of course he was. Actually, after he killed Dylan, he had given Shasta a choice of how she wanted to die. She could either be strangled or shot. Now, she chose strangling because she thought she might have a chance to talk him out of it. Now, he did put a rope around her throat and started squeezing, but she called him by his nickname, which was Jet, and begged for her life, and he stopped. At least at that time. Who knows what he's planning on doing later. After his arrest, Duncan refused to speak with police. They searched his vehicle. They found the shotgun, his laptop, a GPS, a zip-tie package, and a memory disk with photos and videos of the children while they were in his captivity. Well, using data obtained from Duncan's laptop and GPS, they were able to find the campgrounds where he had kept the children and where Shasta had told them her brother had been killed. They were able to find bone fragments. When they confronted Duncan with the evidence they had against him, he did finally speak to them. He wanted society to know that his fantasies involved assaulting and murdering children, and he wanted to hurt as many people as possible as revenge for how society had treated him. Very twisted. Very. According to Duncan, he'd been able to get the family bound and gagged because he told them he was a robber and just wanted to steal from them. And he knew if the parents understood his intentions, they certainly would have fought him. Oh, I would expect, yes. So why did he take Shasta to that Denny's? Some people have suggested that he took her there because he wanted to let her go, or that he wanted to get caught. I would have a hard time believing that. Me too. Now, others believe that Shasta was able to befriend Duncan, and she convinced him to take her there. I don't know about that either. I don't know. I guess we'll never really know. She did, in some ways, she was able to act like his friend and at least save her life right. long enough to be found. How about he took her to the Denny's because she wanted to go there and that was going to be her last meal before sure. he killed her? Sure. Oh, totally, Dick. I think that it could have been that simple. I wouldn't give him any credit at all. No. He would kill anyone. So after his arrest in this case, detectives, of course, had to look into other crimes which could have been committed by Duncan over the years. Criminal profiler for the FBI, Clint Van Zant, told one reporter that Duncan could have been responsible for many more rapes and murders. In July 1996, Duncan was working and living in Bothell, Washington. Just 15 miles away, two half-sisters from Seattle, Sammy Jo White, who was 11, and Carbon, Carmen Kubias, who was nine, who was nine, went missing. They were last seen leaving a motel room where they'd been staying near downtown, and their bodies would end up being found in a field in February of 1998. So these girls did not have an easy life. They were living in this motel. Their mother had taught them to panhandle, and, you know, they were easy targets. Following Duncan's arrest for his crimes against the Grony family, he did confess to killing these two girls. He didn't remember their names, but he was able to give information that would point police to this case. Still, there was never any physical evidence found to support his confession. Well, okay, but why would he confess? Oh, it happens. A lot of serial killers want to take credit for as many as they can. They're proud of it. <laughs> okay. I know, it's sick, but it's true. So as they looked further into the girls' abductions, police learned that they had disappeared around 8.30 in the evening, Saturday, July 6th, 1996. They went to buy cigarettes for an older brother. Apparently the girls had played in the motel's parking lot, unsupervised, and there was an opportunity for their killer to become familiar with them before they were abducted. Investigators also determined that the girls likely had died of homicidal violence of unknown etiology a short time after their disappearance. Their remains were discovered more than two years later, so all they found were buried bones. 
and there, there's no more detail that they could give to that. So homicide was the only logical conclusion. Obviously, kids don't die and bury their own bodies, right? Sure, yeah. So it's important for investigators to find supporting evidence, though, because, like I said, serial killers have confessed to crimes they didn't commit. A lot of people have. The FBI put together a comprehensive list of Duncan's movements and reviewed cold cases involving child kidnapping and homicide. So, as I'm sure you can imagine, this was a complex task as Duncan is known to have visited Washington, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Florida, Michigan, Missouri, and California. Jeez. Those are just the states we know of. Yep. And he's known or suspected of committing crimes in at least five of those states. So in 1997, he had cut off communication with his parole officer, calling and telling him that he was staying with his mother in Tacoma, and his car was broken down. I don't know what the hell's going on with this. I thought if you were on probation or out on parole, yeah. you had to stay at one you, place. You didn't go any place without permission. Just to work and around your neighborhood. But I didn't think you could go off and visit people. Well, he was. Yeah, he was. And after that, he disappeared. He took off with a girlfriend's 1986 Chrysler. So when the parole officer visited Duncan's mother's house... She told him that the last time she had seen him was actually March 31st, 1997. Just days earlier on March 26th, 1997, seven-year-old Deborah Palmer disappeared in Oak Harbor, Washington. And this girl was last seen walking to Oak Harbor Elementary School at 8.35 in the morning. So Duncan had an appointment to have a polygraph exam in Seattle, 92 miles away that same day, it was a 90-minute drive from where Deborah had vanished, and Deborah's body was found five days later, washed up on a beach just five miles from where she was last seen. There was no evidence that Deborah had been molested, but the police still considered her death a sexually motivated crime because she was strangled and she was only partially clothed. Yeah, so the police had reason to believe that Duncan had traveled to Highland, California, in the first few weeks of April in 1997. And then when they checked for any criminal activity in that area fitting Duncan's profile, they learned about the case of Anthony Martinez. He was 10 years old when he was kidnapped by a man with a mustache on April 4, 1997. Anthony had been playing with his little brother and a group of friends in an alley behind their home when a man approached them and offered them money to help him find his lost cat. First he went for Anthony's little brother, but he got away. Then he grabbed Anthony. And according to Anthony's brother, the man threatened Anthony with a knife and forced him into a white 1986 Chrysler. The little boy didn't know the make and model of the car, but his description matched the car Duncan had taken from a girlfriend. Yeah, so little Anthony was found dead 15 days after he was abducted. His body was bound and naked in a shallow grave near Palm Springs. So like in the Grony case, duct tape had been used on Anthony, and it was determined at his autopsy that he had been sexually assaulted. A sketch of Anthony's abductor that was circulated in Southern California then looked a lot like Duncan. So after Duncan was in custody for the Grony murders, a partial thumbprint on duct tape found near Anthony's body was matched to him. When Anthony's mother heard about this, she was outraged that Duncan had been paroled after serving 14 of his 20-year sentence, with obviously no indication that he had been rehabilitated or even wanted to be. None whatsoever. There was no reason to let him out. I don't understand. Yeah, so you did some research on pedophiles, right? Yes. And you got some different findings and stats? Yeah, you check all these different sources, and you get different findings and statistics. So some studies suggest a 20 to 30% recidivism rate with intensive therapy, but then some suggest a rate of up to 50%, and these are on the level 3 offenders, which are the most dangerous. Well, I would suggest that even 50% is low. I think it's much higher that they'll re-offend. Well? But it's just hearing those statistics. Sure. Well, another factor with Duncan is that he didn't really have treatment. <laughs> None. He watched child pornography in prison and showed no remorse for his crimes. So as far as 
pedophiles go. Duncan was really the worst kind, very violent, willing to hurt and kill anyone just to get what he wanted. He's like the worst. Yeah, in an interview after Duncan's arrest, his younger brother Bruce said that his brother should be executed. <laughs> wow. In fact, Bruce was pretty angry that Duncan had ever been released after he had sexually assaulted kids. Yeah. Bruce said that his brother had a twisted desire for children and he wanted to lash out at society. And then one of his sisters, Sherry, would tell reporters that Joseph had been abused as a child. But his brother Bruce denies there was ever any abuse in their household growing up. So we got some conflicting sibling stories. Yes, definitely. Sherry said that their mother had a horrible temper, and Joe seemed to have inherited that temper. But Bruce said he remembers no abuse and that the family was just your pretty average family. Yeah, he said he and his brother went to Boy Scouts and... It was just a normal household. Anyway, so what are these excuses? That he was abused, so he had to do this? I don't think so. Plenty of people are abused and don't do this. Nope. So on July 10th, 2005, there was a news conference where the sheriff announced that the remains had been found in the Bitterroot Mountains west of St. Regis, Montana, and that they belonged to nine-year-old Dylan. It had been confirmed by DNA analysis. So they wouldn't take any questions, but then speculation began about what had specifically happened to Dylan. The videos had been confirmed to exist, and Shasta's statement about her brother being shot to death by Duncan was public knowledge. But some of the rumors about the horrible details are really hard to hear. There was talk of the boy being repeatedly hung and then revived. Another rumor making the rounds was that Duncan had chopped up the boy's body with a hatchet and forced Shasta to put his body parts into a fire. Now that might be more than a rumor. Another idea was that Duncan had videotaped Shasta, and she was forced to pick up burnt body parts and throw them into a culvert. No one but the police, Duncan, and Shasta really know for certain what had been done. But some of the footage would be shown at Duncan's trial. He was charged with four counts of first-degree murder, and several counts of kidnapping for the murders of Brenda, Slade, and Mark. Because binding them up, that's kidnapping. The charges against him for what he did to Dylan and Shasta would be handled in a separate trial. And the prosecutor announced that they would seek the death penalty. So Duncan pleaded not guilty to all charges. So after the charges were made public, there was uh, some more interesting news that came out. And this was news from Fargo. Remember, that's where Duncan was hanging out. Two college girls had filed a complaint with the Fargo police two years earlier against Duncan. They were college students and roommates who had been frightened by Duncan because he'd been loitering in their apartment parking lot watching them. And he was also hiding in bushes. They didn't know that he was a sex offender until they checked a website and they saw his mugshot. But at the time, the police didn't have enough evidence to charge him for anything. No, but one of the students had accused him of stalking, and she'd been so afraid of him that she'd asked her father, who was an attorney, to come over to her apartment. And he had. He had confronted Duncan and told him to stop hanging around the building. But two years later, this father was the attorney who represented Duncan on his child molestation charge in Becker County. So he hadn't recognized him as the man who had been stalking his daughter, obviously. <laughs> I guess not. But Duncan wrote about this situation on his blog, where he denied stalking the students and just seemed pretty proud of himself. So as the prosecutor worked the cases, the video recordings from when the children were in captivity were continuing to be speculated over. Citing unnamed sources, the weekly Spokane paper, Pacific Northwest Inlander, reported that Duncan had recorded multiple attempts to kill the two children. In one video, according to the sources, Duncan had bound and gagged Dylan, but then didn't go through with killing him. So he was really toying with these children in the most evil way. This might be like the worst thing I've ever heard. It's right up there. It's I'll tell totally you. up there. Whatever was on the tapes, the prosecutor said that he would do everything in his power to protect the tapes from the public. He would not support making copies for the defense team. Now, he had the contents of the cameras encrypted to prevent any unauthorized viewing. 
So if Duncan's attorneys wanted to see them, they had to go to his office. The prosecutor explained his caution by saying that the footage was too sensitive, graphic, disturbing, and offensive to be looked at by just anybody. I wouldn't want to see it. Yeah. I think it's the kind of thing you'd never get out of your mind. Well, but at the same time, you're trying to defend your client. You need to look at them. Yes, and they were allowed to see them. He wanted them to come see them at his office. Anyway, in court, the prosecutor said he was concerned specifically about two video clips that were about 10 to 15 minutes long. But in the end, the judge sided with the defense, and he did order that the videos be released. So I guess you're right on that one. Kind of had to do that. you have to. I I don't think there's any way you can refuse or, or make the defense team come to your office. Yeah, I think they were just really concerned that these were going to leak. Yeah. Now, in October of 2006, just as jury selection got underway, Duncan reached a plea deal with the prosecutors. He agreed to plead guilty to all of the charges against him, and he was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole for the three kidnapping charges. So this was for binding Brenda, Mark, and Slade. Sentencing for the three murders was continued, and this was pending the outcome of his federal trial for kidnapping Dylan and Shasta and killing Dylan. He's going to serve a lot of time, isn't he? Well, he'll never be out, and he never should have been out in the first place. On January 18th, 2007, Duncan was indicted by a federal grand jury on 10 counts of kidnapping, kidnapping resulting in death, aggravated sexual abuse of a minor, and sexual exploitation of a child resulting in death. There were also additional charges for illegal firearm possession and auto theft. Then on December 3, 2007, Duncan pleaded guilty to all 10 charges. And as a condition of this agreement, Shasta would not have to testify in the penalty phase of the trial. Well, can you imagine if she had to testify how horrible... I would try to keep her out of there as much as possible. That would be so brutal. So they began jury selection in April of 2008. And this is for the penalty. As this was going on, Duncan suddenly decided to fire his attorneys and represent himself. Well, why not? They haven't helped you much, have they? Well, I don't think there's any helping him at this point. No. Because his attorneys objected to this and said he was not competent to represent himself, there was an evaluation of Duncan needing to be done to determine his competence. So he's just wasting the time and money of people. Right. The way I look at it. So on July 24, 2008, the court entered an order finding Duncan competent and set a hearing on his request to proceed to represent himself. The court held the hearing on July 28, 2008, and it granted Duncan's oral motion for self-representation, finding him to be competent, and that his waiver of his right to counsel was knowing and voluntary. Well, yeah, but it's, it's just ridiculous. Right. And the court had to appoint his defense attorneys as standby counsel. Oh, yeah, he has to have somebody. Wasn't going to be able to do it. Right. Now, he was intelligent, but he had no training or education. It was more just uh, an ego thing, I believe, which just makes it even more disgusting. So videotapes of Shasta and Dylan playing at a Montana campsite were played to the jury in his federal death sentence trial. In one part, Duncan is seen walking over to the back of the Jeep with a large knife, and the children are nearby. The children are seen eating watermelon, then Shasta makes a shocking reference to the sexual abuse they were enduring. So these are just little kids. They don't even understand what's going on. No, they're just saying what's happening. Yeah. It's giving a narrative. There were also photos of the children while they were at the campsite. Steve Groney, their dad, was extremely upset about the videos and photos. And he insisted that anyone who was not involved in the court case should leave the courtroom while they're being played. I think for the most part they did honor that. So they had to be horrible. I guess. Really horrible. So on August 27, 2008, after three hours of deliberation, the penalty phase of his trial ended with the jury's recommendation for the death penalty. Then the judge sentenced Duncan to three death sentences for kidnapping resulting in death, sexual exploitation of a child resulting in death, and use of a firearm in a violent crime resulting in death. These were all for what he did to Dylan Groney, 
Then that November, he was sentenced to an additional three life terms without parole for the kidnapping of Shasta and for sexually abusing both Shasta and Dylan. So Duncan's standby counsel filed a notice of appeal, but then Duncan wrote to the court and told them that the appeal was filed against his wishes. Psychiatrists in prison then diagnosed Duncan with pedophilia, sadistic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder with narcissistic traits. But he was still considered legally sane. So he really was saying he wanted to be put to death and not live out his life in prison. In January of 2007, which was about the same time when Duncan was indicted in federal court, Riverside County, California, charged him with the murder of Anthony Martinez. He was eventually extradited to California in 2009, and he pleaded guilty to the murder of Anthony Martinez, and he got an additional two life terms in prison. The guy only has one life, yeah, so this is all fine and dandy, but it doesn't mean much. He's really just going to go to prison for life. Forever, yeah. Yeah, until he dies. So after he was in prison, Duncan was able to have a blog, which he titled, Joseph E. Duncan III Returns to the Web from Federal Death Row to Expose the Meaning of the Fifth Nail. Psh. Right. Like now, we give a shit, really. All of his content was posted by someone who called himself Silenced, and who was getting what to post in letters mailed to him by Duncan. Because inmates don't have access to the internet, and outgoing letters are scanned for escape plans and contraband. But they're not read word for word, so Duncan was able to get away with this, at least for a time. Yeah, and I'm not even going to give the attention to talk about it. It's a disgusting blog that nobody should look at. But he never did get his death penalty. He was never put to death. Instead, he just lived for years in prison, and then he died of cancer. But to me, if anyone ever deserved the death penalty, it was him. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. So he's gone, but let's talk a little bit about how Shasta dealt with all of this horror from such a young age. Is it really possible to get over such a thing or even learn to live with it? I don't know. And no matter how much research and searching I did, it's really hard to say because fortunately, things this horrible don't happen very often. So after it was announced that Duncan died just last week, March 28th, Shasta released this statement. One thing is for sure, he does not exist anymore. Now we can live our lives knowing that. For so long I have been struggling with hate towards that man. Today I woke up feeling like my soul was finally free. I hope other people affected by Joseph Duncan were able to wake up feeling the same way. Yeah, because she hasn't had an a easy life, has she? No, not at all, and just the fact that she even thought about other people affected by him kind of breaks my heart. Yeah, because she's had issues with substance abuse over the years. In 2014, she was arrested and sent to juvenile detention for 12 months for a drug-related crime. She came out saying that she had received treatment, and it changed. But then in April of 2018, she pleaded guilty to two misdemeanor counts of injury to a child, she was put on unsupervised probation until October 2018. Now, according to the court records, Shasta endangered her one-year-old child by leaving methamphetamine within his reach, and it was in, also in close proximity to her one-month-old baby. At this point, she's 21 years old. Yeah, I just feel like her father loved her, but was he really equipped to raise a child with this many things going on? No. No, I think... Simple she, answer. Yeah. I think she almost really needed to live with someone who could treat her on a full-time basis. Because I don't know much about her biological father, but there were a lot of drugs in this family. A lot of issues. Yeah. So it wasn't the greatest place for someone dealing with what she was dealing with. Plus, I don't think they had a lot of money, although the community did try and pitch in and help her out. But then when she was just one month into her probation... She was accused of violating the terms, and the violation claim was the result of an email from a state health department reporting that Shasta had not been attending the treatment that had been required as part of her probation. So, I don't know what's going on with that. That's just not a good idea, obviously. So then she was put on 18 months of supervised probation. 
there was a certain amount of sympathy for her. Well, definitely. Then in 2019, when she was 22, she and two sons that she has, this was two-year-old Lorenzo and one-year-old Amari at the time, were reported missing. They were found unharmed within 48 hours. Now, Shasta met her husband at a recovery program in Idaho, and the latest information I could find, she's living with her husband, and they have three children. And I think the most recent I could find on that is about a year old, so it could have changed. Yeah, well, it could have. But I hope it's working out for her. I hope she'll be able to have a family and be happy. She has Fear God tattooed above her left eye and Midnight above her right. She also has a small cross tattooed under her right eye and an Oakland Raiders logo on the left side of her neck. These tattoos are pretty bold. Well, I know tattoos are more popular now and we're kind of on the old end of things, but face tattoos to me are often a cry for help. It's bold. It's a bold thing. It sure is. Maybe she's trying to make a statement having that, which is totally understandable. Yeah. She has talked publicly quite a bit about her struggles with substance abuse. She spoke to a local news reporter in 2015 about trying to live her life as a celebrity victim while suffering from PTSD related to her abduction, abuse, and the murders of her family members. Her childhood could never be normal. She said, I didn't feel like I was a normal eight-year-old, and I hated that so much. I wanted to be anyone else but myself. So that's really sad. It sure is. And she said this celebrity status, which was kind of a notoriety, sent her down a really dark path. She became consumed by concerns about her body image, and she started drinking and eventually doing drugs with older teens that she met. Yeah, and she's admitted to having a tough time. Well, of no course. kidding. Yeah. In a 2019 interview, she said, I think that things that happen like that, you can't really forget about them. I think that the images will always be vivid in your mind, or I know that they are in my mind. I feel like I'm doing pretty good, but I do have bouts of depression. I have PTSD and bipolar disorder. Well... And people we've spoken to who suffer from PTSD, I think it's worse than nightmares. I think they actually feel like they're reliving the event. Oh, yeah, you're physically ill. Yeah, and the things she went through, can you imagine having to relive that? I, I can't. wouldn't even want to try. No. So she's really remarkable that she's done as well as she has, really. According to Shasta, she said she was 12 when she started smoking marijuana and drinking. And then when she was 14, she tried meth for the first time. She described how she would pretty much take anything that could help her stop thinking about the horrors she experienced with Duncan. So I really feel like there should have been more in place to prevent her from substance abuse because it was kind of bound to happen. Yeah, that statement about using drugs to help her stop thinking it yeah. really resonates. Absolutely. It? it really does. And she needed an escape. And I think it could have been predicted that that was going to happen. Sure. But it wasn't stopped. I don't know why she was even in a place where she would be exposed to meth. But maybe I'm naive. Maybe you could get it anywhere. Probably. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't know where to get any. <laughs> Me either. Now, when she was 21, Shasta said that she wanted to be allowed to visit Duncan in prison. She wanted to look him in the eye, and she wanted him to hear from her that he was nothing. She said that he took everything from her as a child, and he tried to put her in a position that she didn't even love herself, and she didn't ever get the chance to do that. Well, think about it. So you're a girl, you're going to school, you're reaching your teen years, and all of your girlfriends are getting their first boyfriends, their first kiss, and you've been repeatedly raped and when you were a child. And beaten and denigrated. And witnessed horrors. Yeah. And yeah. your self-esteem has to be destroyed. And you need to be able to build that back up, but I don't know how you go about doing that. But definitely professional help was needed. Yeah, that's <laughs> for sure. But she never did get a chance to confront him. We don't know if that's because he declined to see her. I would imagine that's the case. <laughs> Probably. Because I would think once she was an adult, she'd be allowed to do that. Yeah, when she's 21, if he would agree to a visit, she could have gone to see him, right? I think so. Maybe so. even at age 18. So then another tragedy, her father died in 2019. 
he'd had throat cancer for quite a while. In 2018, he'd lost a legal battle with a trust that had been set up for Shasta. Back in 2005, when all this happened, community members had built a home for Shasta, and she lived there with her father. Then, when she moved away to Nampa, near Boise, her dad was evicted from the house. So the trust managers have stated that their obligation was to Shasta, not her father. In court, he said that the house had been for him and Shasta, but the judge determined that it was solely for Shasta. So when she turns 25, she'll own the house, and she'll be able to do whatever she wants with it. So I don't know, that seems a little bit like her father was a moocher or taking advantage, but hopefully he was just a loving father who didn't have much money or anywhere to live. I'll take that view. Yeah, he was sick. And he did lose children to Duncan. Right. He definitely went through a lot. Absolutely. But what Shasta went through was much worse. It's just unimaginable. Shasta's reportedly working on a book of her story. And she's working with a professional author. But I haven't seen anything published about it. No, I don't think it's published yet. I haven't been able to find anything. But I hope she can make a lot of money off of it because she deserves an easy life from here on out, if anyone does. So back in 2015, she'd also started an online petition for what she wanted to call Slade and Dylan's Law. And in her description, she wrote that convicted violent sex offenders should not be let out of jail, period. In effect, the law would make violent sex offenders stay in prison for life after just one conviction. So she got over 50,000 supporters to sign it, but hasn't been put into law. No. And you know, that was just for violent sex offenders. Yeah. The worst of the worst the should worst never get out worst. again. And Duncan was definitely the worst of the worst. Well, as you said, we're still kind of mystified on how he got paroled to begin with. Yeah, that's a crime. And, and how he didn't get returned to prison when he violated the parole conditions. But Yeah, what's with that? Got me. Well... According to most of what I read, Shasta's substance abuse is a common coping mechanism. Self-medication can be a defense mechanism for people who have experienced crime and is especially linked to those with unresolved trauma or PTSD. According to Victim Support Services, Inc., self-medication is a coping strategy that victims of crime sometimes use just to manage their daily lives. An abduction victim's recovery is often dependent on the relationship that the child has with their caretakers. And I think that was probably a problem for her. Because children generally take the lead from their parents. And if the parents aren't coping in a positive way, then how is the child going to feel that they can recover and move forward and be healthy? Yeah, I mean, the problem for Shasta is that her, her mother, her stepfather, and two of her brothers were killed. So yeah. the, the surviving family, her father and her two siblings, they already had substance abuse issues, and they'd been in some degree of trouble with the law due to these drug issues. So I'm not sure she got the support she needed. Doesn't seem like it. Many people from all over the country reached out with donations and kind words, but that publicity had to be very difficult for a child to understand. And it's questionable if her dad was up to the task of helping her cope. In his defense, he was traumatized too. It couldn't have been easy for him either. Right. Maybe focus on the victim and making sure Shasta gets help. But her father needs some support too. Absolutely, yes. And of course, this case goes way beyond the horrors that most people have ever imagined. There really aren't people out there. You can't go to a support group for a child whose family was murdered and she saw her brother murdered and she was repeatedly raped. And that's just not something that there's a lot of people out there that have experienced to that degree anyway. So she was just feeling really lost, guilty, and angry in addition to grieving for these family members. So I hope Shasta has found some peace with the people in her life now and is able to move forward. She's either 24 or 25 now. And hopefully Duncan's death will help her get away from the memories a bit. The fact that she's still alive and able to love a husband and children, that's impressive to me. It is. I don't think I would survive that. I wouldn't be strong enough. I'm trying to think on that. Yeah, it'd be 
difficult, if not impossible. Yes, yes, exactly. So our sources for this case are KTVB TV Idaho, KHQ TV Idaho, IdahoStatesman.com, the Riverside County District Attorney's Office in California in 2021, the Spokesman Review from Spokane, Washington, Archives 2005 to 2019, a book written by Gary C. King titled Stolen in the Night, the Seattle Times Archives from 2005 to 2020. TCB's music is written and produced by Tristan Capel. If you have any comments to share or a case suggestion or even a beer recommendation, send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. You can also go to our website and you can leave us a comment or leave us a voicemail there. I'll also put a link in our show notes if you'd like to send a note or record a voicemail on your device. If you'd like to get your future TCB episodes commercial free and get the extra members only episode each month, just go to our website, tiegrabber.com and subscribe. Also, if you enjoy our show, we would really appreciate you leaving us a review on iTunes or whatever app you use to listen to us. Okay, Dick, what do we have for feedback? I haven't done this for a couple of weeks, so I got you two voicemails and one email. The first voicemail is from Dara. Jill and Dick, how's it going? It's Dara here over in Ireland again. Another case came into my mind, which you might want to look at. It's the killing of Farah Noor, F-A-R-A-H-N-O-O-R. But if you just Google the Scissor Sisters in Dublin, Ireland, you'll see the case. Um, now, a lot of people think what, what the women did was only for the best. They uh, He was a domestic violence. He used to beat them up. He was very, very abusive. And in, anyway, they cut him up and he was found suitcase in the river in Dublin. And yeah, so if you Google the, the Scissor Sisters Dublin, you'll see the case there. Um, but I think it's interesting. Yeah, keep up the good work, guys. I'm loving us. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Dara. Yeah, so this guy, as Dara said, was uh, not a nice person. The sisters killed and dismembered him. They cut off his head, they cut off his penis, dispersed the body parts. The thing I read was that they found a leg with a sock on it floating down the river. Ah, it's not they, good. They never found his head or his penis. All right, maybe they're together somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Huh. But uh, interesting case. Yeah, so were these teenage girls? or They were young women, 18 and 20 or something like that. Okay. All right, we have another voicemail. I have another voicemail from Robin. She has a couple cases that she's offering up. Hi, Jill and Dick. Uh, my name's Robin. I'm here from New Zealand. Just wanted to say thank you so much for the snifter and bumper stickers, coasters, etc. that you sent. I absolutely love the snifter. I use it all the time, so I'm going to have to get some more, I think. I love your podcast. I absolutely love your podcast. Um, my favourite part is when Dick cracks open the beer and pours the um, the beer into the snifters. The the sound of the liquid going into the snifters is, is quite um, satisfying. I don't drink beer, but I used to drink beer a long time ago. But yeah, I, I really enjoy that. So keep that up. Right. Now, I thought there was um, a couple of cases I thought you might be interested in from New Zealand. One was um, way back in 1992. It's a guy by the name of uh, Raymond Ratama who murdered his family, seven members of his family, including his three young sons, and the unborn child of uh, one of his family's partners. Uh, his surname is spelled R-A-T-I-M for Mary A. That's Raymond Ratama. He was uh, back in 92. Um, the other case that I thought you may be interested in is a woman by the name of Helen Milner, and her surname is M for Mary, I-L-N for Nancy, E-R. Now, she was actually called the Black Widow. <laughs> She's an interesting woman who um, was convicted of murdering her second husband by poisoning him. The interesting part of this case is it was actually her dead husband's sister that actually got all, like got the conviction. She pushed and pushed and pushed and brought all of the evidence to the police, which was not great for our police force. But yeah, she she really did did her homework on that and got her. So amazing case, really interesting case. So um, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear your take on those if you ever get around to to maybe getting the information and reading those ones out. Anyway, I think that's probably enough for now. So take care. I hope everything's going well over there in the States. Um, New Zealand's in alert level one. We've been like that for a wee while. Auckland has been 
keeps going back into level three lockdown because we've got some naughty people up there who aren't following the rules. But um, Wellington, where I live, we've been in level one for quite some time now. So we're doing really well and we hope the states, your part of the states, also gets back into the right level so that you're able to go and visit your family and your grandchildren, etc. So um, take care. I hope everything's going well. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Those are some great suggestions. A couple of good ones, huh? Yeah. And I think we'll we'll look into both of those. Yes, we have been really building on our international true crime library. Yes, we have. So we've had some listeners send us books from their country that have several really famous crimes that happen there, which makes it you know really easy to thumb through and see which one do you think we should cover that would make an interesting show. So it's just awesome when our listeners call in or write in and give us suggestions. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Because you know we're, we're so provincial here that we might not have heard of cases in New Zealand or Ireland. Oh, absolutely. Or Australia, or which is one of our most popular places. Fertile grounds. Yes. yes. So thank you, guys. Yeah, so let's read an email from Ashley. I got one email for you. This is from Ashley. You want to read it? Absolutely. Ashley writes, I've been an avid listener of TCB for years. Your podcast is part of my workday as I listen and chip away at my caseload. There are many true crime podcasts out there, but yours remains my favorite. Thank you so much, Ashley. She goes on, I love animals and I do a lot of work with our local cat rescue, Billy the Kitten Rescue. I love beer and I love true crime. It's a true match. One case that I would love to hear you guys cover is that of Angelica A.J. Hadsell. This case took place in Norfolk, Virginia, only a couple of months after we, my spouse and I, moved here. I added an excessive amount of loves because after all, Virginia is for lovers. I don't recall you ever covering an unsolved case, but that being said, this is a pretty solved unsolved case. I won't lie, Norfolk isn't a stranger to violent crime, just like any other larger city in the U.S. But this story really rocked the community. AJ was a first-year college student who was visiting her parents here in Norfolk when she disappeared. She was last seen on 3-2-2015 by a neighbor who reported that AJ seemed to be in a hurry as she was leaving the neighborhood. Her parents last heard from AJ via text on 3-3-2015 and reported her missing later that night. At first, they really seemed like the grieving parents of a missing young woman who was just starting out in life. However, during the first few weeks of her disappearance, her adoptive father, Wesley Hadsell, was arrested for breaking into a home claiming he was looking for his daughter. That's (laughs) weird. There's, There's a red flag right there. He was charged with breaking and entering, possession of ammunition following a felony, and four charges of obstruction of justice. So this put him on the community's radar as a suspect in her disappearance. But the nail in the coffin in the court of public opinion was that a month later, police located the body of Angelica Hadsell, 50 miles away from her parents' home, after they used the GPS information from Wesley's van. This also happened to be near Wesley's work site. After a mistrial in 2020, the case remains unsolved, but as far as most are concerned here in Norfolk, he is guilty. As for beer, this is a tough one because there are a lot of great craft brews in Virginia, but I have a soft spot for Norfolk, so I will shout out our own Smart Mouth Brewery's Notch 9. It's a tasty IPA, but buckle up, it's a strong one. I'll leave the professional review for Dick. Stay safe, Ashley. So yeah, I'd say he's guilty. Yeah, and the, and the mistrial, I mean, the trial hadn't even started. It was on some technicality. So it's due to start pretty soon from what I was reading. But yeah, it certainly sounds like he had something to do with it, particularly the part about how the body had been found when they looked at the GPS information from his van. Oh, and sure, yeah. That's pretty tough to refute. That's strong evidence, yes. I'm a little confused about why he broke and entered into a house. He was claiming he was looking for evidence. He said he found a jacket or a shirt or something that belonged to his stepdaughter. I wonder if he was trying to maybe plant something and set up someone else. Probably. That sounds like it. Well, what do you know about Smart Mouth Brewery? I like the name. I haven't heard of Smart Mouth, so I'm going to look <gasps> for this. Wow, Ashley, score. You came up with a beer he's never heard of. Well, I'm there's, impressed. There's plenty of those. I don't know. I think you've probably drunk most of them. 
No. I'm a minor leaguer compared to some of these guys. Okay. But yeah, a nice strong IPA that'll peel your tongue off. I think that'd be a good one to try. Does sound pretty good. Yeah. Let's give that a try. I'll look for it. Okay. Well, let's wrap things up. This is a long episode. Yes, it was. And it was really fun to talk to you, Dick. It was good to be back in the saddle. Yes, absolutely. We'll see you next time at the quiet end. Come on down. We'll save a seat for you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.